Portions of this show have been pre-recorded. Uh, yeah. It's a podcast rebroadcast. All of it is pre-recorded. You big dummy. Well, hello, it's BK on the air. Here live at WBHF AM 1450 or 100.3 FM WBHF. I here every Saturday morning from 10 a.m. till noon Eastern. I'm glad everybody's out there. If you can't hear me on the radio, you can always go to uh, download the TuneIn app, the free TuneIn app, or the free Radio Garden app. You can use either app and listen to the show no matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're on the dark side of the moon or the uh, Antarctica, deep space. It doesn't matter where you are. If you have a cell signal or streaming way to get streaming, you can hear me anywhere you are. Or you can just stream from our website, WBHF Radio. Dot org. I do want to remind everybody, in case you didn't know it, some people knew it, but some people don't. I actually turned the show into a podcast. I don't do a lot of work. A lot of people make a podcast from scratch. They have to get guests and, and prepare everything and do everything. And I just kind of take the radio show and pull all the local commercials out of it, add some classic commercial to it that you might remember from the days of old, and some sound bites and some sound effects, and I'll goof on what we talk about and and just augment it a little bit with a little uh, audio um, magic, (laughs) making it special edition, sort of. So if you hear it on the radio, it's going to be sort of different if you hear it on the podcast. So look for the BK on the Air podcast, Anchor, Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud. That's the four platforms that I I offer it out there. So check it out. You might might discover a whole new, uh, different show than the one I do Saturday Live from 10 a.m. to noon. We've got a lot to talk about. Alan Sanders is in here with me. As he usually is every Saturday morning, in case something's going on, if in case he's got to go, uh, I don't know, fix a table, mow a, mow grass, get the house ready for a party, uh, go. Oh, uh, I've got save a, a save a daughter from uh, <laughs> from stranded on the herself. side of the road. Whatever you need, <laughs> save from herself. Whatever you need to do, you still have daughters that one at least that's still in that. Uh, uh, I don't know how much. How old is your youngest daughter? Uh, twenty one. So twenty one. That's 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 adult, but it's still something might happen that she needs. You know how the Riddler away, so. is uh, the classic Riddler costume was a bunch of question marks on a leotard. Yes, it's very variations of it. Yeah, that could be my youngest daughter's outfit, but it's not because she's a riddle. It's because I'm still trying to figure her out. <laughs> and you know what? If we asked her, she'd say the thing, same thing about you too, right? I'm trying to figure my dad out. I don't get him. You know, <laughs> why does he do that? I got to just hold true. My <laughs> other daughters, they're older. My oldest, the other day, I said, hey, do you mind if I give you just a little bit of advice? I know this is a dad thing. And she said, you know what? I'm at a point in my life I recognize you've been around a lot longer. Please. Oh, wow. Tell me what you your suggestion. Did the light go off in her in the side of her eye there? It's amazing it when you start having thing? to adult yeah. that you, re- you start to value the opinions of others instead of just immediately dismissing them. I am 56 <laughs> years old. Oh, my God, I'm 56. When I say it out loud, it just kind of hit me there. I'm like, oh, I almost fell out of the chair. I'm 56 years old, and to this day, I lost my dad over eight years ago. And you lost your dad. How many years has your dad been Almost six now. now. Almost six. So It'll be six I'm in March. I'm still, to this day, at 56, having things hit me where I'll, I'll be going down the road or doing something, and I'll go, oh, well, there's something else my dad was right about. He was right <laughs> about that. Yeah, he was he was right about that. Now he's wrong about some things, but he was really more right about things than he was wrong. And I and I didn't realize that as a teen, as mm-hmm. you don't. It's almost like I wish I could be eighteen now, but mm-hmm. with my brain and experience that I've got. Wouldn't that be a perfect? Isn't that world? why they always say youth is wasted it on is. the young? It's totally wasted. I hate that. One of the things that I, I will it. say, you know, much like your dad, my dad wasn't necessarily right on everything, but the well, no, but yeah. but some of the bigger overarching lessons was. Plan ahead. Think yes. things through. Right. Which so, for for the youth, we don't ever think things through. I know plenty no. of adults who we, never we learned lived that in lesson. the moment. <laughs> yeah. What was what popular right then? What's going on right now? Do I need so, it right now? No. That is the biggest lesson that I learned. Hey Lee, Lee from the Etowah Scholarship Foundation, going by and getting a nice healthy breakfast from our good friends over at Ross's. Healthy breakfast. I love healthy yeah. breakfasts. Healthy breakfast and Ross's. I think that can that, that phrase is an oxymoron, but well, I love it's personal. Ross's. Biscuits and gravy with sausages. Mm. I think it's healthy, so it is. I get it. I identify that as healthy. <laughs> I, d- so I believe yeah, it's good so for it's me. It's good for me, right. I I will tell you, their bacon, egg, and cheese. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I, I mean, know. it's You're made on an actual that. griddle with real butter. Yeah. And I bet our dads oh. our dads enjoy good breakfasts, too. Yeah. yeah. Now, here's the thing. Yeah. I work off my breakfast. I know for a fact I go out there and do a lot of stuff. No, I don't know what your, your excuse is. <laughs> 
but I don't have one. I but just don't. Uh, I just you know, because I, I always run to those people like, well, my grandfather ate this way. Like your grandfather worked fourteen hours a day plowing a farm. You sit for twelve, and most of it's binging TV. Right. There's yeah. a, there's a reason that people um. uh, from the little house on the prairie days stayed fit because they worked from sun up to sundown, right. just trying to survive and work the land and do things. Right. And then when they came home at night and had that fat back and bacon and and biscuits and gravy and all that it's all full of gluten there was no gluten free back then <laughs> there was no fat free back sorry then. do you have a vegan you know version fat free in those days was don't eat anything <laughs> eat nothing Dude, that's th- fat free there's also a reason why they had so much fat and high protein <laughs> diets because they were working and they needed the they needed that to burn Are throughout you the day they needed energy yes yeah because they were actually expending it and what else did they do back then? They spent a lot of time in the sunshine. Yes, they did. Getting Outside. That vitamin, that vitamin, uh, vitamin, uh, D. vitamin D from sunshine. You know what's uh, funny I is they... <clears throat> See, I'm going to do a side comment because you brought this up. Okay, squirrel. Even, even during the Spanish flu, hospitals knew to take patients, even if they were bedridden, outside right. for an hour or so for right. sunlight and fresh air and somehow our wizards of smart in the last couple of years forgot all the lessons that our prairie slash 19th century now early 20th right. century all of that got all of a sudden forgotten well we life goes on as we always say and it's always my dad always goes yeah well you know uh, you don't like getting old the alternative is bad you know always be, well yeah i'll be grateful stop. be grateful that you're on the right <laughs> side of the grass i'm like and i always am but we did lose a few people. I'll, I'll, I may start that off after we come back from a break in uh, Pat, Pat McCormick, Golden Rage of TV Today, which is on, if you remember the sitcom on ABC, Barney Miller. He's doing Barney Miller Day. It's another new episode of Pat McCormick's Golden Rage of TV. Uh, we One lost, of the first cop shows I ever remember watching on TV when I was a little, little kid. It was a kid. sitcom, but it was a cop show. It, I mean, it was set in a cop show. office. Yeah. And I never, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about it Precy. a little bit more after he does the thing coming up after the break. But uh, I never watched Barney Miller as a kid. And that's one sitcom I didn't get into and watch because, I, I don't know, I just didn't. My dad liked it, but I didn't watch it. But I'm sure if I were to watch, watch Barney Miller now, it'd probably be incredibly funny to me because I, like, I did like those 70s mm-hmm. sitcoms. And it was successful for a reason. It was probably very funny. I think it was and had a lot of good actors in it as well. But, I'm much uh, like you. Coming up after the break. Here. I have remembrances of it. If you asked me to even give me an entire plot of one full episode, I could not do it. I, I had a great theme, and then I might play it after his Golden Rage TV report when we come back. Speak here, and we're going to take a break now, but we're going to say also say goodbye to some celebrities that passed away this week. I don't know if I can report on every one of them, but some of them passed away. And one of them, a uh, great guitarist, man. If this guy's not on your list of great guitarists that you have, why not? He was a, he was a talented and one of the best guitarists ever lived. It's BK on there. We'll also talk about a, a star who had an accident from the Avengers. Some bad news probably about him, but like my, like my dad would say, he is still alive. And a guy uh, playing pickleball, something weird happened to him. And I'll tell you about that, too. It's unbelievable. It's BK on the air. We will return after these messages. Hi, time for timer. And time to make a week's supply of healthy after-school snacks. Now some weekend when it's raining and your mother is complaining because you're hanging around just twiddling your thumbs. Tell your mom that you've been itching to make something in the kitchen. And oh yes, the mess will be a minimum. But the thing that's going to please her is you make it in the freezer and nothing could be easier to fix. Now just watch as I go through it. Really, all you need to do it is some kind of juice and just a few toothpicks. Okay, now take an empty ice tray and fill it up with orange juice or lemonade or pomegranate juice or whatever turns you on. Then cover the tray with plastic wrap, carefully poke the toothpicks through the plastic, put it in the freezer, and in a few hours, presto, stacks of snacks. Don't wait until it rains before you try this nifty trick. You'll have a fun time making sunshine on a stick. Ever watch kids play with Weebles? It's really something. Hey, hey, look at me and Weeble. Me and Weeble go all around. One day, kids pretend they're flying into Weeble Airport. Next day, they play around the Weeble Cottage. Or if it's real nice, they go out to the Weeble Marina and go fishing. Hey, hey, look at me and Weeble. The Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Romperoo makes Weeble toys. We now return to our program. Greetings. 
Greetings, fellow Classic TV fans. Barney Miller ran from 1975 to 82 for a total of 170 episodes. Although not the instant hit that most would think, the show always had the full support of the ABC network, which eventually paid off. It grew into a timeless classic, but cop-based sitcoms had been around since the days of Andy Griffith and Car 54. What seemed to set Barney Miller apart was that even real-life cops felt that it was more realistic than many of the police procedural dramas filling the classic TV airwaves. From an article in the New York Times, it was reported that most NYPD officers felt the show's emphasis on the non-glamorous realities of police desk work combined with the humorous banter was actually more true to form and how it usually really was. Another realistic aspect of Barney Miller was the casting of the highly diverse cast. Main characters included actors of Asian descent, African American, Hispanic, Caucasian, and one of the earliest inclusions of an openly gay recurring character. An actual NYPD detective is quoted as saying, Life really is more like Barney Miller than NYPD Blue. Actor Dennis Farina, who you'd recognize from the series Manhunter, Crime Story, and L.A. Law, was an 18-year veteran of the Chicago Police Force. He called Barney Miller one of the most realistic cop shows ever on television. The series' many awards included two consecutive Golden Globe Awards for Best Television Comedy. In 2013, TV Guide rated Barney Miller at number 46 in its top 60 best TV series ever. This is Pat McCormick with your retro TV trivia from the Golden Rage of TV. You can also find me on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at Golden Rage of TV and on Twitter at Golden Rage of TV One. And now back to BK on the Air. W-B-H-F in Cartersville. Thank you, Pat McCormick, for that trip into the golden rage of TV. You know, Barney Miller had one of the best. It really had one of the best TV things. It had like this bass That line. bass riff at the beginning. Yeah, man. Playing the bass. Man. And the guitar comes in, you know. You know, and it, it's got that '70s funk. I know. I never, and I never. If I watched it today, I'm sure I would. I would like it because back when I was a kid, my dad watched Barney Miller, and I never. I just never got into it, and never could watch it. But, and I was a fan of the sitcoms of the '70s. I mean, even as a kid, I watched Sanford and Son. I watched All in the Family, which, you know, think about it. All in the Family, that's not a kids show, and in the '70s, no. it definitely wasn't. But it was. But it, but it was funny enough to. You know, Carol O'Connor's Archie Bunker, he was just animated and funny enough for it me to at least think it was funny. Mm-hmm. And I liked it. And, and I love the Honeymooners with Jackie Gleason, which, by the way, believe it or not, Jackie Gleason was first asked to play uh, Archie Bunker. And he turned the role down because he thought it was too crude. He didn't want to get into <laughs> that type of humor. So he went on to do funny, Smoking the Bandit. Funny, he goes to the Bandit. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but, and I think, I think that wasn't the reason Jackie Gleason did that because CBS at, back at the time was purging a lot of their uh, older they – they were taking their old TV shows and going, oh – we don't want this type of stuff anymore. We want cutting edge stuff like All in the Family and the Jeffersons mm. and things like that. So they started getting rid of variety shows. You know, Jackie Gleason got the axe. Gunsmoke got canceled. All those old, the Beverly Hillbillies, those old type fo- shows, they were like, that's out. We're canceling those. We don't even care what the ratings are. We're getting rid of them. We're, we're moving forward. So that might have influenced Jackie's. <laughs> He's like, no, if you cancel my show and you want me to play this guy, I ain't doing that. I'm not Could doing been. that, pal. I also know, <laughs> and, and this kind of ties into what we learned about Blazing Saddles when we did the show. Um, oh, the podcast, sometimes yeah. sometimes you're your own brand and you want to protect your brand. Because I, I didn't know this until we did our research, that Mel Brooks had approached John Wayne. He's like, there's no other cowboy that every, everyone knows John <laughs> right. Wayne in yeah, Westerns. sure. John Wayne Bill read Brum. the script. Said, I'm going to sit down and, t- and, ch- and had coffee. He goes, I'll tell you what, this is a very, very funny script. I think this is going to be a very, very funny movie, and I will be the first person to buy a ticket to watch it. But I am not going to be it in it. But it ain't for me. No, I am not going to be in it. <laughs> going to be in it. And, you know, that's, that was that And was it was so right. funny because Mel Brooks was all excited because John Wayne said, I've read it. Can we meet? <laughs> He's like, oh, he's coming to meet. And he's like, I think it's funny. It's going to make That's a funny movie, funny. and I'll be the first person to buy a ticket. Well, and we, we kind of glossed over it, and we just said when we, when we, when we talked about uh, 
Blazing Saddles. Let's tell everybody when it was on the podcast, oh, The yeah. Wilder Ride. They can still go out there and it's, listen to it, it. It's so evergreen. When you have a podcast, you don't you can go get today, get brand new, because it's a movie we talked about from 1974, yeah. so it's not like it ages. It's not like we're talking about current news. Right. But yeah, season two of The Wilder Ride, if you look for The Wilder Ride podcast, you were on several episodes as a yeah. guest, and me and my Blazing buddy Saddle Walt. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we did Blazing Saddles for season two. We did Young Frankenstein season right. one. So yeah, you can go check that out. We broke that movie down one minute of the movie per Per episode, and th- and by the way, I want to always tell you and Walt give you all a thank you because when you guys, you especially would ask me, hey, we're doing whatever podcast on the Mel on the uh, Gene Wilder movie. Uh, do you have a preference on what minutes you want to do? You always give me the option of that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, give me this part because mm-hmm. I love this guy and I want to talk about this. And you all have always been in com- accommodated me to whatever minutes I want to cover. And I appreciate that because with, 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 uh, with, um, Blazing Saddles. It was the uh, one of the episodes that I was on was when we were talking about um, Robert Ridgely as the part where he's the executioner mm-hmm. in that scene because I'm a big fan of his. He's a character actor, did a lot of cartoon voices and stuff. And then when we did the uh, Young Frankenstein, I said, "Listen, can I be on the on the um, part of the show? And can at least be on the episode where it's got uh, who's who's the actor um, uh, Mars that played the, uh, the Bruno Mar- not Bruno Mars, just the singer. Yeah, uh, uh, you know who I'm talking about. Yes, Mr. Mars, whatever his oh, first Kenneth, name is, Kenneth, Kenneth Mars. Mars, who played. Inspector, what's his name? Inspector. Uh, st- uh, I can't remember his name. Hold but he has that crazy uh, accent. Hold the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be on the episode, uh, uh, the part with the he's in when he comes and talks to him. And you guys said, yeah, I could do that. So I appreciate that. And then hopefully the Wilder Ride. I'm hoping the Wilder Ride is kind of still, is just more of in hibernation than dead. It's in, it's in w- cryo it's sleep right now. It's asleep. Now. <laughs> okay. So it's like, it's like, bu- it's like Bucky. We're uh, drifting um, through uh, Federation territory, <laughs> hoping to get picked up. <laughs> <laughs> the Wilder it Ride may be 86 years from now. The Wilder Ride is Bucky in the Black Panther. He's been put on ice. Wait, it's, it's coming to me. I'm remembering. Inspector Kemp. 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 I remember that Inspector all my Kemp. own by looking it up right here on the internet. So, uh, and and, and, and the, the Wilder Ride podcast is coming back. I know it is. And we, you guys have talked about possibly doing... Uh, another Gene Wilder movie because that's yep. what you cover Gene Wilder and other things you've done other movies and other specials and we did a holiday one for uh, July the 4th yeah I want to do uh, they may fi- become well we'll see what they well, become when, when you finally hopefully <laughs> when you finally hopefully examine the movie Silver Streak one minute at a time the Gene Wilder movie Silver Streak I want to be involved in the minutes that that are Patrick McGoo and heavy. Okay, <laughs> because Harry, there we go. You see a trend. I like the movies that you're doing with Gene Wilder, but I want to be part of the minutes that. Uh, concentrate on a actor that I really enjoy and like. So it's not that I don't like Gene Wilder, but the guest stars in the films are what I want to be a part of. And uh, yeah, Patrick McGowan was a fantastic um, actor. Do you remember the? Do um, you remember the movie? A lot of people forget that he was in that. Who was that? John? Who was that author named John Grisham? Do you know mm-hmm. who I'm talking about? John you're Grisham, a big book yeah. reader. Didn't he? Didn't he do a movie or a book called A Time to Kill? Yeah. And that, the movie was Samuel Jackson. Yep, that was exactly. Patrick it was McGowan one of his... was in that as the judge. Do you remember mm-hmm. him being in that as the judge? Yeah, he's been in a lot of movies outside it, the prisoner. It put and, Matthew and, McConaughey uh, on the map with that role. See, I've never seen the movie, but I, I heard like I'm like, oh, Patrick Stu- Patrick McGowan's in it. I love Patrick McGowan. He played King Longshanks in Braveheart with a fake nose, oh. <laughs> which was undoubtedly Talk. one of the best. Bad guys. I mean, he was so horrible as the. He's good as the character. Oh, he's so horrible. good as that character. But he was great in that film. He's just an underrated uh, actor that that just amazed me. His TV show he did called The Prisoner was such a cult classic. Where he's he's number six and he's on this. Uh, is in a city called the Village where he can't escape because he was a secret agent. He knew too many things, and this is where they go to kidnap them to keep them against their will. And uh, he was in that. Uh, remember the Johnny Rivers song back in the day, Secret Agent Man. Mm-hmm. I mean, you heard that song, That's Secret the, Asian that the, Man. That was the thing. Well, I was. It was another show, <laughs> but uh, Secret Agent Man was um, the TV show. Actually, it was just called Secret Agent, American show, which was uh, kind of re-edited. Uh, it was called Danger Man in, in the in the UK, and over here it was Secret Agent Man. And Patrick McGowan was kind of like it was a TV TV James Bond show. Is what was really good. So Patrick McGowan, I don't know how I got sidetracked, but I did. But uh, some people have uh, passed away this week. Seemed like it was a few. I'm like, oh, they come in threes. No, they came in more than threes here in the past couple of weeks. No, but they're Adam, coming around the word suddenly. Yeah, Adam Rich, child star, passed away. Now he was in a show that I never watched. Eight I never enough? watched Eight Is Enough. That's one of those shows as a kid where it was a drama. I'm like, I don't watch dramas. I'm, I'm doing good to to watch uh, the Waltons. Uh, so, but I, I don't watch Eight Is Enough. But he was. 
child actor. He passed away unexpectedly, and uh, or I don't know if, if people knew him. Maybe it was expectedly. I'm not sure. Uh, I saw that this week, uh, Evil Knievel's son, Robbie, passed away. That was from cancer, like, though. We yeah, know that, that was for cancer. A fact. We knew and he was yeah, we knew sixty, that. right? I think he, he was, was 60. sixty, and they they showed some of the some of the videos of him jumping, and he mm-hmm. was almost as successful doing it as his dad was. I think he it was died. Amazing. Was it pancreatic cancer? Is that, that what he it had? was? Yeah, that's, which is when you get that. That's, that's the net. one that when you're our age, we're like, going, no, I don't want to. I don't want to hear that. Can I have a different cancer? Can I spin the wheel? Try again. Sometimes when you hear though that 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 one's hard to beat. I hear. Yeah. No matter what, it's not the one you want to hear. No, I don't really hear any. I don't want to hear the c word ever. Um, um, Lisa Marie Presley passed away of a, of a only she went into 54 a car, cardiac arrest. And then mm-hmm. we saw the, this, the, it was almost like a few minutes later. I'm sure it wasn't a few minutes later, but I saw the, uh, the story that, oh, uh, I showed it to Mrs. BK. I said, look, Lisa Marie Presley just had a heart attack. She's like, oh no, that's terrible. And it was almost like just two or three hours later. I, and I wasn't keeping up with it. And I don't know it was actually that long, but I showed her, I'm like, oh, by the way, look at this. She, she died and it was just kind of unexpected. So I'm like, Wow. Sudden, That's unexpected amazing. cardiac arrest. And uh, a guitarist passed away this week, uh, Jeff Beck. Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a snippet of, of the, the one guitar solo that he did in a song when we come back from a break that really kind of turned me on to Jeff Beck. I'd heard about him and knew about him, but I wasn't. I didn't know about everybody in the 80s. I only started learning more after I started getting older. And uh, some more news coming up, and we'll flash the audience of the news, Strange and Bizarre. You listen to BK on the air. And now, these messages. Flip, 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 flip. Flip is the digital game that you can take with you anywhere. With the batteries you supply, the light-emitting diode zips across the screen. You try to press the right button to send it back. An automatic readout keeps score. Two people or only one can play. When you play with Blip, you get carried away. And so does Blip. Blip, the digital game. From Tommy. Break open the mint that sparkly fresh. Break open the mint that cools your breath. Break open the breath savers. Cool, refreshing breath savers. The blue in the middle breath mint that's sparkling fresh and sugar free. Break open the mint that's clean and brisk. A breath that's fresh enough to kiss. Break open the breath. Hey, we're back. It's BK on the air here on AM 1450 and 100.3 FM WBHF. We're having a good time as usual. We never not have a good time when I'm on the air. At least we don't hear in the studio. And now comes that wonderful time that we like to bring you the news of the weird, the strange, the crazy, and the bizarre. And I know they're all true because why? I read them on the internet and brought them into the studio. It's a time we like to flash the audience of the news, the weird, the strange, and the bizarre. You know, you flash there from Flash Gordon. You won't believe how many people go, I listen to you just with the news flashes. I'm like, okay, just show you're listening. I don't care why you listen to the show. I got the first news. You're in the room with me and you're ignoring me. I've got to, I could no, go home and get I that. I was ignoring you. I was just, I was listening, believe it or not. From UPI, a California man said a phone call led him to get out of his parked car just moments before it was crushed by a falling boulder. Oh my gosh. You don't believe in guardian angels? But that dude does. Mauricio Hino said he was parked outside his home at the side of a hill in the 20,000 block of Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, a road that I've driven before. And there's a lot of rocks up there, believe me. When he got out of his car to answer a phone call from his girlfriend, <gasps> this is so weird, who asked him to retrieve something from inside the house. She called him just right at the right time. A four-foot boulder landed on the roof of his car, caving it in, caving it in when he got out. Quote, the rock is the size of my whole hood of my car. The windshields are all broken, and the frame of the car is just all twisted, Hanano said. The rock slide debris was dis- <laughs> dispersed across four lanes of traffic, damaging at least one other parked car. Now, no no injuries were reported, but, you know, a coyote was seen leaving the area shortly after the in- incident. Very swift. So, yeah. So there you go. Hey, close calls, man. I had a few on a motorcycle back when I had a motorcycle. I had a close call here and there. You, 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 do you realize how fast adrenaline can take your heart rate from zero to 60? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that one time where I w- almost pulled out into the intersection and this tractor trailer decided, I'm going to run this red light. And I'm like, 
Yeah. Had I stepped on the gas any faster, I oh, would yeah. have been dead. Oh, yeah. I know. It's, it's called, you know. I wonder, All right. was there an intervention somewhere? I don't know. I believe in guardian angels. I do. I've got the next news. Some people will think you're... These are pets. Some, some people... <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing lines from two dead guys. I started to go... Sorry. Some people would think you're up to something. <laughs> They're not entirely we'll domesticated. Ta- we'll talk a t- more about those two guys yes. in our Done This Day in History. But they will stay with you <laughs> forever. All right, I've got the next news flash. It's uh, an 89 year old Florida woman had something extra to celebrate during the holidays when she received her uh, master's a degree. Something extra? 89, got her master's. Joan Donovan donned a cap and gown for a private graduation ceremony outside of her Florida home to celebrate earning her master's degree in creative writing from Southern New Hampshire University. Bravo! Donovan said she graduated high school at the age of 16, but her family didn't have the money for her to go to college. She took some postgraduate courses at her local high school, but education fell to the wayside after she got married and started a family, as would have been the case at that time. Donovan went back to school to earn her associate's degree after her children moved away from home, and she graduated with a bachelor's from a four-year university at 84... She determined she wanted to earn her master's in creative writing, but her college didn't offer a program. She ended up enrolling in the uh, SNHU's online program to pursue that goal. Don't tell me you're never too old to try something or accomplish something. Together, let's give it up for her. Way to go. When I hear that is a great story. Of these older folks skydiving and getting their master's degree at 90 and just and just doing the things that maybe they should have done or just have always wanted to do. I hope I got enough courage and know-how and and the drive to want to do that when I get older. We we're just talking about that on the that air. That was earlier. awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Well done. I got another news. Firefighters in Los Angeles battled an unusual blaze when several pallets of hand sanitizer caught on fire in a parking lot. The Los Angeles Fire Department said crews reported to what was initially thought to be a trash fire Monday afternoon in a downtown parking lot, but the firefighters soon discovered the small blaze actually was caused by several pallets of hand sanitizer. Quote, the product is confirmed to be hand sanitizer, which is clean burning, the fire department (laughs) said in an alert. Clean burning. The safest operation is to allow the product to burn off while ensuring it does not damage damage any of the vehicles nearby, unquote. Firefighters said they prevented the flames from spreading to nearby vehicles and that no injury reported. Yeah, and everything was really very well sanitized and cleaned. After and everything the fire was smelled over, so. like uh, lilac. <laughs> Now, if you, I guess this, if the ones that are high in alcohol content, if you pour hand sanitizer out on the concrete or whatever, can't you just burn, set it on fire? Yeah, that's probably why it that, they just let it burn itself is it out. that flammable hand sanitizer? It's like alcohol, so yeah. Yeah, a lot of them have. That's what dries your skin out. You're not there supposed to are. use them a lot. Unless they've added aloe to it, you know, for s- skin softening, right? That makes it good. I've got the next news. <laughs> why not? It says it on the package. It says it. Marketing, they would never lie. The cereal says fortified with minerals and minerals and iron and stuff, Good even though it's you. got sugar in it. Hey, did you hear the Ghostbusters Afterlife sequel is trucking right along? Good. Fire, I, firehouse. Talk about uh, a much-needed rebrand. You, you know, it wasn't a reboot. It was a, hey, let's forget it three. It was a sequel, yeah. Let's forget three. Let's just. And, and in I, fact, have, I have forgotten two, three. We <laughs> have to a- acknowledge two, but let's just build on what was so good about number one. And we can't even call it Ghost the Three. It's, it was just a remake. It, it, it was. It what, was. Uh, what? No, there wasn't. Was it? Was it a remake or was it a reboot? What, what, did, did the ghost? Did the female Ghostbusters film acknowledge trying, the old characters nope, at all? Not okay, at all. so it was a reboot. Okay. They were trying to boot it with yeah. a new cast. I, I, I checked out. After, I gave it the boot. You did? I checked out after 30 minutes. The I'm only like, thing that's worth watching, I will tell you. I know I get to the I'm, news flash. I know where you're going. Can I guess? Chris, yes. Chris Hemsworth as the secretary. So <laughs> he was funny. darn funny. He was just goofy funny. I swear to God, still so out of character. One of my favorite visual gags in that <laughs> is he was like a wannabe actor, and he had headshots. <laughs> And he's like, which is better, me playing the right. sax? And then he puts it to his ear or me listening to the sax. <laughs> so I'm glad they're thinking about it right now. And he was, he's proof he can do that. Earl oh, my God. That. All right, I have the next news. So unthor like <laughs> So but Thor. did it not give him the chops he needed when Thor three kind of reshaped his character a little bit? Right, and then it, the he chops became, the chops went over the all over the hill in uh, Thor. Love we don't and we Thunder. don't talk about we Love and Thunder. About, okay. All right. On December twenty, while a restaurant in um, Airlie Beach, Queensland, Australia, Poppy Pike apparently found herself in a predicament. 
Who's Poppy Pike? I got to find a out. Twister. Melanie Pike, Poppy's mother, caught the moment on video when she discovered her daughter was trapped inside a claw machine. <laughs> you know those machines where you go guy try to get a little fur doll or the something claw. out of it. The claw. The claw. Uh, mm, <laughs> Poppy's older sister had convinced her to get inside the claw machine in order to grab some teddy bears. Pike and her partner were reportedly enjoying lunch when they were alerted to Poppy's difficult situation by the eldest daughter in the family. Poppy was able to get <laughs> wow. out in a matter of five minutes with wow. careful instruction from her mom. Poppy was able to direct herself back through the hole she had originally entered as seen in the video. Wow. That's amazing. That's I would have done that to my sister. I was terrible. I was terrible. I would have made my sister do that. That's terrible. I don't know. You? Yeah, I would have done it. I, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm horrible that I said that I would, but I have. Uh, do we have time to squeeze this? Let's try to do it. I have the next news. From the AP this time, Spanish police are searching for 14 people who ran from a commercial plane after emergency landing, which was forced by a woman faking that she's, she was about to give birth. The Pegasus Airlines flight from Morocco to Turkey landed at Barcelona's El Prat Airport on Wednesday afternoon after the women claimed that she was going after the woman claimed she was going into labor. Authorities say that once the plane touched down, the group of twenty eight people exited and tried to flee. The police managed to stop half the group, but fourteen escaped uh, escaped officers at the airport and remain at large. The woman, who doctors later find out was pregnant but not about to give birth, was arrested on suspicious of public disordered offenses. Spanish authorities said five of the people who were, uh, who were caught agreed to be put back on the flight from the uh, Moroccan city of Casablanca to Istanbul. The rest are being processed for non-admission to Spain. I'll bet they were. According to authorities, it's expected they, along with the woman who are allegedly faked giving birth, will be put on another Pegasus flight out of the country. You don't have to go to extremes. Come on. Why are you faking having a baby, you know, if you want uh, you want something done? Don't do that. Because if you start messing with flights and things like that, that's not good. That's going to hang with you for a little while. Yeah, because, you know... You start you get everybody mad at you on the plane too. By the way, especially these people that start arguing about something, and I've never had that happen to me on a plane yet. I've never seen a disruptive knock on wood, and I've never been the disruptive. No, <laughs> you know, guy. Oh, believe me. So I've wanted the, to the be foot incident that got me uh, where I am today. <laughs> is that what is one now? that may have the pushed me over the edge? Foot, but even then, the I still did foot it. incident. Because you know what? I'm like, I'm not gonna get myself put into federal no. custody for being a, jer- a jerk on a plane. And you know, you have the creeps about feet. You got anyway. snakes on a plane? I'd be jerk on a plane. okay. You remember Goldilocks, the kid who used to take her meals at the Three Bears place? Nowadays, she heads for Shakey's with 21 kinds of great pizza and even more kinds of fun. This is what I call a fun place. We serve on at Shakey's also pizza. Shakey's! Look at that big yellow bike. It has 3,000 speeds. Wow. But this is my favorite big yellow thing. Kellogg's Sugar Corn Pop Cereal. It's big. And that gives sugar corn pops a big yellow corn taste. Big, hmm? Real big. I make that big yellow corn taste part of my good breakfast. What's this? Hold on! That's the big yellow horn, son. Kellogg's Sugar Corn Pops. Big yellow corn cereal. Big yellow corn taste. Burger King presents four bright, colorful Star Wars glasses. Hey, it's Luke Skywalker. And the princess. Gee, wow. Get your kids a different Star Wars glass each week. Buy a regular serving of Coke for 59 cents plus tax. Get Chewbacca. Get Darth Vader. R2-D2 and C-3PO. What mission? What are you talking about? We can get all four. Star Wars glasses at Burger King until February 2nd. It's okay if you don't understand what he's talking about. He probably doesn't either. It's BK on the Air on AM 1450, FM 100.3, and online using the TuneIn Radio app. Just a, oh, well, not a few more. We've got one I've got one more. more news to squeeze in here. Yeah, the, the world's largest strip club has enlisted the help of the biggest security guard ever seen. The world's largest strip club. Yeah, and it's not really about, it's not and it's not really not messing about. Hmm? This is a weird sentence. I guess sentence. that's an Aust- uh, British or, or European way of writing that. I don't know. I didn't write um, it. The robotic doorman was in town for the, at the same time as the annual CES, or Consumer Electronics Show, convention, billed as the most influential tech event in the world. 
Peter Feinstein, the club's managing partner, also added in an online statement, it only makes sense that the world's largest gentleman's club would have the world's largest security guard. As you can imagine, the robot has attracted plenty of attention online. Replying to a post about the new security guard, one person said, what in the Terminator is this? Terminator. (laughs) Well, it's kind of funny you should say that, pal, because this isn't the first tech-inspired stunt sapphire gentleman's club has pulled. Wow. Back in 2018, when CES was in town, the club unveiled robot exotic dancers. The robots, created by British artist Giles Walker, had heads made from discarded surveillance cameras and body parts from mannequins and car, spa- uh, and car spares. The eerie-looking fembots were also able to gyrate on a pole and mimic the moves made by their human counterparts. Feinstein said, at the time, this is our 18th year for the club, and we felt we needed to come up with something new and unique. All right. Well, there we go. That's the last news flash. Now, we talked earlier in the program today about some I'll celebrities. I'll be in the back room. <laughs> so, are you a bouncer? <laughs> <laughs> we talked earlier about some celebrities passing away here with BK on there, and uh, I happened to mention guitarist Jeff Beck, and I wasn't that familiar with Jeff Beck. I know it was in the 80s I wasn't because I hadn't really started paying attention to things that were really crazy outside of the realm of stuff that I listened to. But over the years, I've discovered Jeff Beck, and what really put Jeff Beck on the map for me is when I was younger, at least in the, uh, I guess in the late 80s when this song came out, I'm trying to think, is he has a guitar solo. He worked a lot with Rod Stewart, and he has a guitar solo with Rod Stewart in a certain song, and this what's really this is what really made me first Stand up and take note of Jeff Beck. That's uh, Infatuation from uh, from Rod Stewart. Ah, oh, was it ca- was an album Camouflage? I think was that was the album that that was. Was that that video? He was taking pictures from a far away. He was infatuated with that model actress. I can't yeah. remember her name, but yeah, that's right. You know that whole line: "Take a picture to last longer." Well, yeah. he made a video around yeah, he it. He did. He certainly did. So he was in. Fa- it was Infatuation. Uh, legendary guitarist Jeff Beck. You and I were only talented with the air guitar, and the- we're pretty good with that. Yeah, but we can't. I can't do it. I'm not a music person. I can't. I never got it. I tried. I tried taking piano lessons back when I was in elementary school. But music is mathematics. There's a lot of mathematics in music with notes and things, and I just couldn't grasp it. I just went and I gave up. I'm like, I'm not for this. I'm a music listener and appreciator. I can't do it. Speak on there. We'll be back. The number one smash hit from Daryl Hall and John Oates. And now the next one, One on One. One on One, Man Eater and Family Man from Daryl Hall and John Oates. The album H2O on RCA Records and Cassettes. Available at Musicland. Turn it on. Leave it on. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. What? Turn it on. Leave it on. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. Turn it for hours a day. In stereo. Interviews. Features. Your day. Your premier video special. Music news. I want my MTV. 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 Too much. What? Yeah, too much. Never. 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 Never enough. Now back to the show. Oh, yeah. Hey, we're back. We're speaking on the air. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> Some people wait for the commercials on this show. <laughs> They're like, oh, he's on a commercial. Good. I don't have to listen to him. <laughs> well, you know, that's fine. You'd be that way. That's all right. Uh, hey, the f- commercials are the best part of his show. Well, you wouldn't like the podcast then because uh, <laughs> I take the commercials out. Well, I put different commercials in there, but it's commercials that you know and love and maybe remember if you grew up kind of in the same era did, I did. I'll, th- I'll throw things in there like uh, uh, Calgon, the Calgon commercial where it's like ancient Chinese secret, Calgon bath, uh, mm-hmm. Calgon washing liquid or whatever. How do you get this so clean? Whisk, whisk, stuff like that. I try to purposely choose old commercials to remember of, of maybe things that aren't around anymore because mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you're giving free advertising. Advertisements to Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I'm like, I don't care. It's a podcast, and it's an old Reese's commercial. I like that. There's no, mm-hmm. What's wrong with that? 
Nothing. Tell me what's wrong with that. Not a darn thing. Well, now we've reached the point in the show where I like to at least do it at this time. Every Saturday on this day in history. Today is January the 14th, and there's a few hap- things that happened on this day in history. Some good, some depressing. We just said goodbye to some uh, uh, celebrities earlier in the show. And uh, some actually passed away on this day, and we'll get to them here in due course. 1952 on this day in history, January the 14th. The Today Show on NBC premieres on this day in history, a popular t- uh, morning news show. It's been around for many years, since 1952, with Dave Garraway and Jack Luscoli on NBC. Hmm. I don't even know. If, I, I have no idea who guys. they even are. That's back in the 50s, you know. Uh, today on this day in history, a music premiere, 1956. Little Richard re- re- releases Tutti Frutti <laughs> on this day in history. Little Richard was great. What a rocking guy. I still love it in Predator when they're in the helicopter and they're going on the mission mm-hmm. and uh, Jesse Ventura's character reaches behind him and hits play on the cassette set player and it's uh it's um it's a little richard song and i'm gonna have me a fun tonight <laughs> long tall sally long, is playing sally. as they're on their way to She's their mission so sweet that's right i got everything the uncle, uncle john, john needs <laughs> he's walking along getting ready to kill somebody and uh singing that some song fun. can i have me some fun i'm gonna have me some fun <laughs> That's great. I love that. 1967, another music premiere, and the beat goes on. The song Beat Goes On by Sonny and Cher released their signal, single on this day, a year after I was born. You know, there's a there's a commercial for Dodge. I think it's a Dodge commercial from 1967 or 68. Uh, you ever heard of the, a singer named Petula Clark? Yeah. She does, and the beat goes Downtown. on. Yeah. She, sings, she does the Sonny and Cher, and the beat goes on, and it's an old Dodge commercial from the 60s for a Dodge Dart or a car or something. Mm-hmm. And as she's singing it, they're tapping on the uh, they're tapping on the uh, the the, um, the car and the hubcaps going. Then the beat goes on. I never forget that commercial. Today in 1972, Red Fox and Demond Wilson premiere Sanford and Son on NBC on this day in history. And you guys at the Wilder Ride had Demond Wilson on as a we guest. Did. We Go did back, guest. check out the Wilder Ride podcast. You can hear an interview with Demond Wilson. Season four, he was with us. Yeah, he's he's great. I thought he was hilarious as Lamont. He was a great foil uh, for, for Red Fox. Straight guy to play for Red of. Fox. Yeah. He was great. 1973, there's another music thing here. Aloha from Hawaii, an Elvis Presley concert becomes the most watched broadcast by an individual entertainer on this day in 1973. I can believe that because it's Elvis, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had the most of everything sometime uh 1976 a television premiere on this day in history the bionic woman the spinoff from the uh six million dollar man bionic woman with lindsey wagner debuts on abc television but later moves to nbc i never really delved into why that happened but i'm sure there's a reason and somebody out there knows it but i can't believe that two different shows were on on two different networks that were connected and crossed over with oscar goldman and some storylines and whatnot i don't know if that's ever been done since then crossing over because usually if you got one show on one network the other that network doesn't want you to watch their show right because they're on a different network well that was different with that one and i don't know why but the bonnet woman was great i used to watch i didn't watch it as much as the six million dollar man i didn't get to see it as much but it was definitely a ratings hit 1977 oh my goodness how interesting that we've got two Ricardo Montalban stories on on this day in history. One of them, 1977, Alan Fantasy Island, starring Ricardo Montalban and Hervé Villachez, premieres on ABC TV. Now, to me, Fantasy Island growing up was a way, it and the love boat, it was kind of a way for old TV stars that were retired, some old ones, would come back and play a role on these shows because you're like oh look sid caesar is on an episode of uh of the love boat oh <laughs> look it's uh somebody who hasn't been on tv or movies for years but they're on the love boat or fantasy island tonight that's <laughs> interesting my wife's watching the new fantasy island show the new one and i haven't seen it she seems to like it so i haven't really checked in and watched it yet but uh i think on fantasy island if my memory serves that roddy mcdowell showed up at least once or twice or from time to time or maybe just once i can't remember as mr rourke's opposite he was dressed in red and he represented i don't know if he was playing the devil but he was very evil kind of a guy he was dressed in red he was the evil counterpart to mr rourke and i'm like oh that's interesting which is interesting considering yeah. you would argue mr rourke might have a little bit of a darker edge based he did on earlier he, yeah he but did. i know all of his stories were supposed to be about you learning a little bit more about yourself yeah that's right and and where did they never got into it but where did what was mr rourke where did he get the power to do this on that island I'm like, you know, back in the was day... Was it the island and he was who just knows? the MC. Back in the day, we didn't need to know that when we were presented entertainment. I didn't need a complete backstory all the time. I think that's why the newer... 
the newer remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre maybe didn't do it. Maybe it did did well, but it didn't do well with me because they felt the need to have to explain why why Leatherface was the way he was. Mm. He said to show his backstory, and I'm like, what? It was enough when I saw the original just to know that he, they were just evil and they were just doing this thing, and they needed to get away from him. So that was okay with me. Maybe I'm a little simplistic compared to. Uh, kids today i don't know but i do like to drive and have a driver's license and i work yeah so i do, do there that. is that uh in 2008 messenger spacecraft performs a mercury flyby for the first time in 2008 on this day in history we're getting if you'd have told me what's going on now back in the 70s i'd be like oh that's sci-fi stuff but we really got some great stuff going on with technology and stuff you can talk bad about technology all you want but the but the, the leaps ahead or amazing when people would tell me oh they don't make cars like they used to i'm like yeah you're exactly right they don't they make them better and i had to, i had an argument with an older a relative with of mine one day at a, at a function where i'm like no actually cars are better made now than they were in the 50s and the 60s and maybe the 70s they are they are better they maybe don't look as classic of course anything is classic just because it's old mm-hmm. and has those lines you don't believe me? Go to the Savoy Auto Museum, and you'll see just how classic old cars used to look. Well, you know, newer there are a lot of cool-looking newer cars now, oh, yeah. too. It always happens. So it, technology moves us forward. But no, cars are built better today and do last longer than older cars do. I'll argue with anybody on that. Uh, today we lost a celebrity in, ni- in 2009. He was 88 years old, and we just mentioned him on fantasy, uh, with the Fantasy Island. Ricardo Montalban passed away on this day in history. An iconic actor with an iconic voice. Mm-hmm. Another actor, iconic actor with an iconic voice, passed away at 69 years old on the state history in 2016. Alan Rickman mm. passed away. An actor that I know you and I are big fans. We're big fans of both of those guys. Absolutely. And I know there were never anything together, but wouldn't it have been great if Ricardo Montalban and Alan Rickman would have shared a scene together? <laughs> that would have been great. You know, Alan, you're a VT. Emotion, emoting actor, and I, I really enjoy you very much. Quite. <laughs> the response would be like, respond. clearly, right. fame isn't everything. It's BK on the hair. We'll be back. The 1979 Cordoba. Perhaps its essential luxury can be known only by driving it, for this is a liberation, a new freedom. A most rare experience. As you turn and climb, there is a feeling of continuous achievement. Cordoba. Classic styling, uncompromised comfort. Cordoba, the contemporary classic from Chrysler. We'll just make your photo fresh. At Taco Bell, Taco Bell. Make you feel your taste buds on the air. This is Mrs. BK, and I'm not listening now because, well, I sleep in every Saturday morning, but I'll catch him later on the BK Escape Pod podcast. Now, back to that man of mine, BK on the air. Mwah. Yeah, she is sleeping in today. I know that for a fact because she was uh, had a really wild week at school as a teacher. She, I almost feel like I live with a student that has to go to school, a teenage student, because in the morning I hear the same thing parents used to hear when your kids are going to school. Oh, I don't want to go to school today. <laughs> Can I just stay home and play sick? I'm like, no, you got to go to school. Come on. <laughs> Come on, let's get to breakfast. Let's get going. Get dressed. Let's get ready to go. Come on. Don't Come don't on. maybe turn the light don't, on. Don't dawdle. Don't dawdle. Don't dawdle. Come on. So yeah, so she's uh, she's deserved a well a well deserved sleep in today for Mrs. BK, and she's doing it. I want to continue on with on this day in history. We got through all that, but let's go to birthdays. It's all it's, every day is somebody's birthday. Just like every day has something happened from it from history. Some are not as interesting as others. Sometimes I have to really look to find out things on this day in history. Some have too many that I have to admit. I can't do all of them. Today is Mark 
Goodson's birthday today. Alan, you ever heard this, the name Mark yeah, Goodson? Yeah, wasn't he like he created the Family Feud and some other game shows? He and his partner Bill Todman, his business partner Bill Todman, you always heard at the end of these game shows, a Mark Goodson and Bill Todman production. Oh my goodness, I've got a secret, the price is right, password, match game. They had so many game shows under their under their belts. Well, he, was, he died in 1992, but today is Mark Goodson's birthday. Today is an actress's birthday, very famous actress, everybody remembers her, Faye Dunaway. American actress, Chinatown, Bonnie and Clyde, Supergirl. I mean, she's been in so many productions and so many things. Mommy Dearest, where she plays Joan Crawford. And you know what? I love that movie where she plays Joan Crawford, Mommy Mommy Dearest. Have you, have you ever seen that movie from no, the early but- 80s? Great biopic about Joan Crawford. And she, to me, it was a role of a lifetime for her. And I think that she shuns that now. I think that she won't talk about that. And I don't know why she doesn't like that movie. Or maybe she's warmed up to it since then. But there was a time, I think, where she wouldn't talk about that in interviews or something. Well, it is a little disturbing sometimes. seeing an adult beaten up on a kid. Yeah, but it's a role, though. I mean, it's a, I it's, know, a, it's a role. But I, don't, we know, I, but I don't think that was hey, the problem. Are she human had. beings flawed? Do we sometimes well, cross she was playing, the role? She was playing with one. Person? <laughs> she was playing one. Maybe that's why she didn't like being. I think sometimes people go, "Wow, it. you know, it's one thing to play a role, but you did that so well. Maybe you are like that." Well, and, and people and then, will make and, that and mistake. People who don't really have all their bread done upstairs would uh, actually think Larry Hagman was an evil guy because he played J.R. on Dallas. There I mean, come who on, that. please. That's, that's, those are the, what we I call We talked the, about it with Poltergeist, the guy that the landlord, yeah. de, the land developer, he actually he had a gig in Canada helping being like the spokesperson he was for a, good a, actor too, yeah. a, a grocery chain. And after Poltergeist, there was a letter campaign demanding he no longer represent the grocery chain for what, what he did <laughs> In Poltergeist. Why do pe- why do humans decide to do that? Do they have a little something off kilter? Because I'm like, okay, I can always separate that. I mean, uh, th- we they're, can. They're the, they're, they're the <laughs> people. I, I call them Beatles screamers. When you look at videos of the Beatles or Elvis, and people are screaming and passing out because that person is just <laughs> singing a song, I, it's people like that scare me. Right. That, that react like that. You're that emotional over a person who sings. Get a grip. And it wasn't just kids. It's sometimes adults doing it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so crazy for this person. I can't stand it. Well, that, I'd throw them into that group. Uh, today is another actor's birthday. He was uh, he played Apollo Creed and Rocky. Played in Predator. He was Action Jackson. He's even in The Mandalorian. Carl Weathers' birthday is today, so we celebrate Carl Weathers' birthday. Another guy that I thought was great. Now, when he broke out with that his own solo movie, Action Jackson, I was looking forward to it and I watched it. It wasn't that great. No, it wasn't. Very it good wasn't at all. that great of a movie. So I was a little disappointed in it. But it, it was star. It was his first, I think, starring vehicle. He was the actual main star of that film. And today is an American screenwriter and director's birthday that we both admired, and we think he's very talented. Lawrence Kasdan's birthday mm-hmm. is today. You know, anytime he puts you know he puts his name on something, I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. Lawrence Kasdan's one of those guys that can just – he's got it. Like people that can – musicians that we talked about earlier that can write music, know music, just see music in their in their heads or whatnot – I admire the people who are very talented storytellers, too, because I'm like, oh, I, I could try to write a story, but it's not going to be anywhere near the quality or the caliber of a Lawrence Kasdan or a Peter David, one of the best comic book writers that ever lived, all these writers, mm-hmm. um, Edgar Allan Poe, Shakespeare, yeah. you know, all these people who can write. They can take a, a, a writing instrument, where it be a pen, pencil, quill, whatever, and think about something and write it down and then modify it and, and put it together. I just i am amazed at that, too. It takes talent. Some people think they can write that can't, too. So right. I, we have I've that, too. That. <clears throat> and it's always National Something Day. Today is World Logic Day. Hmm. Mr. Spock would be proud. This would be Spock's today. day. World Logic Day. And believe it or not, I didn't know this, but today is the Feast of the Ass Day. I didn't know that either. Did you know that? Of the Asp? Yeah, Ass, A-S-S. Feast of the Ass Day. Did you know that? No. January 14th began as a medieval Christian feast and commemorates the Israelites' flight into Egypt. That's what the Feast of the Ass Day is. Is it because of donkeys? donkeys? Yep. That's what it's called. You might have to explain that. I did. I just did. (laughs) (laughs) Medieval Christian feast. If I go home and say that, I don't think my wife's going to be thinking about the Israelites. Well, when you say it, start out with the description first and tell her what it's called. Just do it backwards. That'd be better. So... That might, that, that, way. that might be better and, and safer for our FCC friends. <laughs> That's right. I did mention we were talking about on this day in history. Today is uh, Alan Rickman's birthday, but he passed away. Uh, and we also were talked about Ricardo Montalban, who passed away. Well, it, there's a the METV Legends, METVLegends.org. They interview a lot of actors and actresses. 
And I'm glad they did it because it's, it's like recording their interviews and you learn a lot of things from it. Well, Ricardo Montalban, few, many years ago, got to talk to them about going from Fantasy Island to Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan to play Khan. And, the, and uh, this, is, this is what he was talking about with them on this interview. I was doing Fantasy Island. We, uh, we lasted seven seasons. And at the end of the sixth season, during my hiatus, Harvey Bennett, the producer, offered me this role of Khan, which was based on a character I had done many years ago when it was a television series. It was called Space Seed. I mean, a super, super very powerful, who is then abandoned into a, is it habitable, but un, un, uninhabited, no, uninhabited, inhabited uh, 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 planet. And he's left there, and, um, and that's it. That was uh, So now they go through all the different villains to see what the next show is going to be, because the original show was, um, the villain was a, a ship that is computerized somehow, something goes wrong, to kill, you know, Kirk and all the Enterprise, kill him. Now, the concept is interesting because there you have, as, a, as an enemy, a man, or a, 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 an object that has no fear, no fear whatsoever, and it's just to kill, it's computerized to that. Very interesting. However, there was no communication. Oh, here it comes, you know, here, here, here it is, and suspense. But there was no communication, so you have to have a real villain. And they went through all the different villains. I want to take to mind. They said, wait a minute, it'd be interesting to see what happened to him in that planet. He was abandoned. And, and that was how the thing was born. Well, let's have Ricardo, you know, it's many years later, older now. So. And when they offered me the play, the part, it isn't that I think um, that there is a, a part that is too small for me, no, but there was in a way because after six years of Fancy Island, which is a very successful series, I want to be on the screen uh, with a more important role. You know. When I read it, I thought something. I thought, well, when I am not on the screen, they're talking about me. So it seemed, and besides, it's an interesting role. I think I can do something with it. However, I said, okay, I'll do it. I begin getting acquainted with a character, which I, I have to bring from way back. And I begin to then to articulate as I memorize the dialogue. And to my terrible despair, I sounded to me like Mr. Rourke of Fancy Island. Say, the audiences are going to laugh me off the screen. They're going to believe that I am Khan, the Superman. I sound like Rourke. What is it? What is it? What is it? So I called Harvey Bennett. Harvey, would you send me a print of the original Space C? And he sent me that. You know, and I, I played it. And I played it again about three times. About the third time, I began to remember what I thought then as an actor, what what what, what I was trying to accomplish, or what I did accomplish, whatever. And all of a sudden, it came to me. So what I have to do now is bring that character and then make it passionate because he's blaming Kurt for the death of his wife whom he loved passionately. And so he was revenge, revenge. And so I have to play this character fully. I'm not going to play it safe. I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to play it full of passion. Vengeance, not for himself, but for the memory of his wife whom he adored. And all of a sudden I began to read and to my... I, 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 I was convinced by that time that, that Mr. Roth had disappeared. And then indeed I, I have become Khan. And then of course I had the great joy of working with Nicholas Meyer, who's a director, a brilliant young man. And he knew what I was doing. He let me go with passion all the way to almost there. Because if you go a little farther, then you become ridiculous, you know. If you play it safe, it's dull. So he allowed me to bring the passion up to almost almost a point there, you know, at times. And he, he would say too much or too little. He really guided me beautifully, and I owe a great deal of the success that Khan had to Nicholas Meyer. So there is a little bit of Ricardo Montalban talking about transitioning from Mr. Rourke to Khan. He didn't quite have it at <laughs> first. So he wanted to make sure that he wasn't, so he was, said he did it in front of the mirror, and he goes, oh, I sound like Mr. Rourke. 
<laughs> so he was always he always thought maybe I should uh, try something a little different. So I like that. That was really engaging to hear the thoughts. Yeah, and you could tell he was kind of working his way through re- the recollection as he was telling the story right. in the interview, and it was really captivating. And you can't deny that Ricardo Montalban is a great actor, great performer. Uh, during the break, I showed you a clip of him on a um, on a Zorro movie that Disney did on. Uh, I think it was just a Disney TV movie that they had produced back in the ABC or late seventies. I don't know if it was on ABC or what. Somebody, somebody played. It might have been syndication where he's playing like the evil counterpart to Franklin Jealous Zorro. And again, he's in it and he's fantastic in it. And you you said your kids grew up with him in Spy Kids as the mm-hmm. grandfather. So. Well, not no, as the uh, on, on the our cartoon. cartoon Kim Possible as the voice actor for <laughs> one of the villains. I just think it's amazing that he did an animated series voice for him to do it. Speaking on there, we'll have more fun when we come back. I got some more stories here we can get to before. The program is over. Sponsored by Parker Brothers. Homemade fun for over 90 years. Boom, 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 boom. Parker Brothers, bonkers, wit, and funny, twist and track, and send you back when to go forward, or forward to go back. The bonkers board keeps changing with every single play. With bonkers cards and bonkers dice, it is not the same game twice. And you go back and forward faster in a bunker's kind of fun. And you're certain that you're losing, but suddenly you won. Bunker's is fun. Bunker's is life. Bunker's is never the same game twice. Bunker's from Parker Brothers. Munch a bunch 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 of free toast go with lunch. Munch a bunch 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 of free toast go with lunch. Nothing gives your old lunch new life like Fritos brand corn chips. So munchy, so full of good corn taste. Fritos corn chips make lunch munch better. You're listening to BK on the air. Now back to a guy who put me through a lot of pain in childbirth. I'm his mother, I should know, but I love him anyway. It's BK on the air. Yeah, Mom, but the, the pain isn't around anymore. I don't cause you any pain now. It's your grandkids and great-grandkids that give you the pain. Now, I stopped giving you pain a whole, a very long time ago. 56 years, as a matter of fact. We were talking about that earlier, I can't believe how old I am. I've got this story from Sarah Whitten and CNBC. You know, we just had the new year. We went through Christmas and stuff and mm-hmm. buying gifts and stuff. Well, I didn't, I, I may have known this just in the back of my head, but this kind of, this story kind of confirms it. The headline here, adults are buying toys for themselves and it's <laughs> the biggest source of growth in the industry. Now, I knew that adults had been buying toys for themselves, but I didn't know that it, that it accounted for the biggest source of growth in the industry. There are two things keeping the toy industry afloat right now, in inflation and consumer groups known as kid, kid adults, K-I-D-U-L-T-S. Adults. These kids, at heart, are responsible for one-fourth of all toy sales annually, around $9 billion worth, and they're the biggest driver of growth throughout the industry, according to data from the NPD group. Uh, This cohort, which NDP defines as ages 12 or older, has been steadily contributing to the industry for years, but spending has accelerated in the wake of the pandemic that we had, and I guess we're still in it, but I don't think we are, leading to the one year-over-year gains despite the tough comparisons. Uh, It's an important moment for the toy industry, too, with the holiday season. It just passed, and they went through us through it while sales er surged during the holiday season across the board for board games puzzles and play sets during the pandemic the first nine months of 2022 saw a three percent decline in sales volume however and higher toy prices helped outweigh those losses as sales revenue for the time period jumped three percent they report kid adults who tend to spend more on toys have a great fondness for cartoons, superheroes, and collectibles. You know, the nostalgic stuff that I like to talk to them about on this show that remind them of their childhood. They buy merchandise such as action figures, Lego sets, and dolls that might typ- typically can be considered for kids. See, we knew all this here, but it's, here's an official report coming out, and I'm telling you about it. However, in recent years, toy makers have created product lines just for these consumers, realizing that demand is high for this generation of adults who still want to have fun. Quote, the definition of adulthood has definitely evolved, said Jeremy Padower, chief brand officer at toy company Jazzwares. What it used to mean uh, to be as an adult was to be very up 
standing, serious member of society. And to do you do that, you had to demonstrate it intellectually, emotionally, in every other single way. I, I think you can be one of those and still buy toys, can't you? He also says, now we feel a lot more free to express our fandom as part of our adulthood. He said, well, I'm glad this story is finally coming out and making it big. And it was kind of something that we've kind of known about mm-hmm. kid adults. I just didn't know that they had a phrase for what we are. Uh, along here in the 70s and the 80s the toy business began to shift away from being an industry that was just about the next innovative item and embraced creating more products based on entertainment franchises well duh to be sure there were toys based on movies and tv shows prior to this time but it is when the trend kicked into high gear that was late 70s and early 80s the kid dalting trend starting to rise and uh, started to rise in prominence around a decade ago as superhero movies and comic book culture exploded into the mainstream. It became more consequential to the bottom lines of toy companies in the last five years, says James Kahn, editor chief of the Toy Book and senior editor <laughs> of the Toy Insider. I'm familiar with the Toy Insider, but not the other one. Now, toy manufacturers such as Lego embraced these consumers and created lines often tied to nostalgic entertainment properties just for this type of uh, demographic. Hasbro's Black Series for action figures is an example of this, tapping into the desire for high-quality Star Wars and Marvel collectibles. Even Mattel has lines from Barbie and Hot Wheels that are designed specifically for a group of buyers. Toy companies have even begun creating their own television and movie content in order to to support toy lines. Mattel launched its own internal movie company and is set to release Barbie, which is coming up, the movie Barbie, in July of 2023. And Hasbro uh, bought E1, E-O-1-E, and will set Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves in theaters in March. I think that's with Chris Pine Mm -hmm. is in that. It is, Yes, sir. These films are not designed for young kids, instead catering to this older group of toy-loving consumers. Other brands such as Funko Pop have always catered toward adult collectors who are uh, in tune with their, they're always in tune with their inner kid. And a lot of people are. And people who listen to this program probably already knew this. But we just wanted to make it official because now it's an official, it's being reported out there in the media, and they're actually now finally, you know, recognizing this. Thank goodness the media is so quick on things to notice what's going so on. So on top of things. I think I've known that since the 90s that that was going on. Oh, yeah, adults buy toys. I know a few. Mm-hmm. I've known a few to buy toys. You know, in fact... Got a couple of friends that that have, uh, or at one time had the biggest, uh, Commander Clark had one of the biggest Star Wars collection, not the biggest one in the world, but the biggest one personally that we know, biggest Star Wars collection of toys, and uh, Indiana Sean, Sean Murray had a had a huge Indiana Jones collection. We'd go to their house, and I was just like, I didn't even know that they made a toy of that <laughs> for Indiana Jones. That's fantastic. It was almost like walking through a museum and i looked at him once and i he had a i think he had a reproduction of the cross of coronado and i said this belongs in a museum just kind of confirmed that the line from the movie so what's it doing in your collection it belongs in a museum but so do you i don't <laughs> dr jones boy isn't it funny now, i'm gonna i'm gonna get off the rails and be a, and, and get distracted by a squirrel here for a moment the guy that plays the the guy with the cane that said mm-hmm. that to Indiana Jones, who he's been chasing for that that the cross for yeah, that the white guy, <clears throat> the white suit, it's like Panama Jack or whatever. <laughs> That's the same actor. I'll, I'll give you a, a little six degree, a little six degrees. It's not Kevin Bacon, but it's a, it's a connection. Do you remember the uh, Van Leeuwen from Aliens that was telling Ripley they were firing her, holding her responsible for what mm-hmm. happened in Alien or whatever? Same guy, same actor. That's in Aliens talking to Ripley as the old guy in Indiana really? Jones. He's a he's an American actor. He's been in a lot of stuff. He was in, he played a role in Space 1999 and a lot of other British productions, but he's an American actor that lives in England and is an actor there and just was more successful there than America. Huh. So so I can't remember his name, but Well, they wanted a foreign guy. sounding guy for their shows. Yeah, and he's foreign to them. <laughs> Because hey, as that, we know, you both do that al- Yankee accent really well. Aliens, Aliens was, it may have been 20th Century Fox and James Cameron producing it, but it was a British production. It was a, he had a British crew and mm-hmm. a lot of British actors. Well, Pinewood, in the or without those studios that yeah. were big, they're all were in England. And we know how much uh, Lucas and Spielberg have to do with England with the Indiana Jones movies as well. So, yeah. So there you go. Adults buying toys. Now, some of them buy them for different reasons. Some of them buy. A collectible. And they're like, okay, I bought this action figure in this pack. I'm not going to open it. I'm going to leave it sealed and put it up on the shelf for display. I'm like, okay. Some people buy two. One to open, play with, and fondle, or whatever they want to do with it. Well, no. Action. Put it in action. It's an action figure. And one to keep sealed, put it up on the shelf to collect. 
Then you have the, uh, the third type, that buy three of them, one to display, one to play with, and one to sell later. <laughs> so <laughs> different adults, you know, they, they collect things for different reasons. And uh, I got rid of a lot of stuff. I don't know what happened to me. A few years ago, I think it was right after my dad died, whether that had anything to do with it, I'd have to talk to a psychiatrist about but I'm not sure. I don't know if it hit me that way. But I started noticing I had too much stuff. I got too much stuff. And, and I didn't get rid of everything. I purged a lot of stuff. I'm like, you know, if I haven't touched this or looked at it in a year and it's got dust on it, it's gone. Because I can't keep amassing things because we're going to move soon. we got to you know, buy a new house and consolidate and do this and that and the other thing. And when we buy a new home, we're downsizing. Our new home is going to be a little smaller than the home we're in now, but it's going to be new. And it's just it's going to be big enough for the two of us, obviously. But we're in a, and we're in a house that uh, my significant other had first before I, before I married her. But it, it housed, you know, children grew up in it, so they needed more room. Mm-hmm. We're not going to need that much in our next home, so it's going to be a spacious. Come, it's going to be a spacious house, but it's not going to be. They're as not going to come visit. Uh, sure, <laughs> yeah, they can come visit. Yeah, see, we had those grand ideas that. until the kids moved out. I was like, we sh- we can downsize now. We have much. I was like, yeah, it sounds like a good plan. And then they all came home for Christmas after being gone, and my wife was like, I like having the house that everyone can come home to for Christmas. Yeah, see, we're we're so not guess that what? way anymore. <laughs> We've turned the corner. We're like, come by, celebrate Christmas Day. But, you know, when 3 or 4 o'clock rolls around, <laughs> time to go. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming by for Christmas. Sayonara. That's totally okay. It's okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. So, I, I, but, yeah. And I don't I don't disagree. I just I had that moment of going, stay. oh, we're going to have a big house still. Huh? <laughs> they could stay, you know, so somebody could sleep on it, you know, and they do it now. They don't even use the bedrooms we've got when they come over and stay out of town. They, they bring a big inflatable bed with them in the living room and just sleep there. I'm like... This is a bedroom. Your old bedroom. I don't want to. St- I want to stay down here and watch TV and fall asleep. I'm like, okay, go ahead, knock yourself out. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's the kids' way of doing kids. Things. The older I get, the more I the more I uh, value having. Oh, it's a comfortable bed. I just want to sleep in bed. This sleeping bag thing and uh, stuff like that. It ran its course a long time ago. I, I, I'm done sleeping in interesting places. I want to sleep where it's comfortable. It's not so much an adventure now to sleep. It's more of comfort. Yeah, the bathtub is a contour to my back. Sure. No, it's not. I'll no, try it that. is not. No, it's not. No, it's not. Maybe if you pass out in it, <laughs> like that, it's better than being on the cold floor. I don't know. Porcelain's pretty cold, too, and so's uh, plastic or whatever bathtubs are made out of some of them. I've never passed out in one before. Thank goodness. It's BK on the air. Stand by. We got uh, the last segment of the show coming up. Dow Bathroom Cleaner with scrubbing bubbles cleans bathroom soils right down to the shine. What power? What power? What just put the muscle on dirt and scum? Oh, we scrub it away fast. Oh, we do. We really do. We disinfect and deodorize, too. Okay, germs, you're all washed up. <laughs> Look at the shine we leave behind. We work extra hard so you don't have to. To leave your bathroom sparkling clean, get Dow Bathroom Cleaner with scrubbing bubbles. I hate how they wrinkle my suit. You ought to see my cleaning grill. Oh, they rub against my neck. They're uncomfortable. How about this for an alternative? The safety belts are way too confining. I'm in complete agreement, more or less. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. This is William Shatner, and I would like to invite you to take a journey with me into the 21st century. So take the next few minutes and listen very closely. You'll be amazed at what you hear. Okay. Mm-hmm. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the fandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Figaro. I'm just a poor boy, nobody loves me. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. He's very distant from his own Easy come, easy go, will you let me go, Miss Mala? No, you don't have to go. Let me go, Miss Mala. No, you don't have to go. Let me go. Mia, mamma mia, mamma mia, let me go. Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me, for me, for me. 
Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, what a great song by Queen. Obviously, that is not Queen doing that version of Bohemian Rhapsody. That is the big man himself, the Shat, William Shatner huh. with Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> in the hands of an adolescent. I Coming believe in. you have managed to shock me today. <laughs> Good. I always like to try to manage to shock you from time to time. Why do I play that, you ask? Well, I play it because from Slash Film, there's an article come out that I had no idea that this was the case. Mike Myers had to fight to get Bohemian Rhapsody for that famous Wayne's World scene. Remember the scene where they're driving mm-hmm. the, uh, the Wayne's World mobile? It was a little, I think it was an AMC Pacer, wasn't it? Or there was the Gremlin. I can't remember which car it was. They had this goofy car that they drive around because they were just a bunch of goofballs. <laughs> And they started headbanging to uh, that version, that part of the Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. If you've ever s- never seen the 1992 film Wayne's World, you probably know about the scene where the main character is seeing Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody in the car. It's one of those film moments that stick in your head forever. forever. Wayne's World was based on the reoccurring, as we remember, Saturday Night Live sketch created by star Michael Myers, which his character, Wayne Campbell, and his best friend, Garth Algar, Dana Carvey, host a cable access show in Wayne's mom's basement. I remember doing a cable access show back in the 80s. They were the rage back in the day. You could have, you could do a cable show about anything back in the day. In fact, it was the only the second feature based on a Saturday Night Live sketch after the Blues Brothers was the first to get a sequel, by the way. And I didn't know that. I'm like, had it been that long since the SNL, I guess, based thing had been a movie? I didn't know that. On the fictional show, Wayne and Garth wax poetically about women, cool stuff, and the music they love. The film and the sketch spawned a ton of lines that people, you know, or me, or people like us, quote, <laughs> like, uh, party on, uh, yeah, if, as if, and monkeys may fly out of my butt. And, of course, the other one, swing. swing. The sketches were wonderful, and I absolutely remember the Bohemian We're Rhapsody scene. We're not worthy. <laughs> like it, I remember that like it was yesterday. It's already a pretty cinematic song full of wild tempo and style changes, crazy high notes, group harmony. You know, the stuff that Queen was known for. And if you've seen the movie Bohemian Rhapsody starring... Uh, Fabulous. Uh, who, was, who plays uh, Freddie Mercury? He played the Bond villain in the last Bond film. Why can't Remy I? Remy Malek? Remy Malek. Uh, fantastic movie directed by Brian Singer. Great movie. I mean, it is as bad as... The life Freddie Mercury had, the behind-the-scenes stuff was hard to watch that he went through and had to do. It's a well-put-together film. It's uh, a great bio kind of watching somebody self-destruct along with the success that they had. You cannot sing this song with a straight face after Wayne's World. I mean, some people, it, was, it influenced them to do that. It's absolutely required to get all dramatic with it, even if you're in the car by yourself, something the other drivers on the road have often seen people do before. Oh, you must be singing Bohemian Rhapsody beside me. You must also be headbanging when the guitar break comes in. So... Time it right with the traffic light, or you'll be in trouble. It says <laughs> the scene almost had difficult, different music, according to Vanity Fair video with Mike Myers, who had to fight to get that song in the film. Myers said there was another song from a different band in play, but for him, Bohemian Rhapsody had the right comic value. It's hard to think of a Guns N' Roses song that would have made, that would have been as epic as much as uh, you love music. The only one that comes to mind that would work maybe uh, was as a narrative is November Rain, but it's not exactly a funny song from Guns N' Roses. Mm. Sure, it has a fast tempo, ch- tempo change and has a story, but it doesn't have the rangy vocals and a sense of fun that Bohemian Rhapsody has. It's not that kind of song. Just thinking of these guys in the back of Garth's Mirthmobile singing and headbanging with a nauseated buddy's need to spew, <laughs> as the film says, being part of the song and the story still makes me laugh. Music was a huge part of the entire Wayne's World franchise, and on Saturday Night Live segments, the guys were visited by you know people like Madonna, Aerosmith, and Meatloaf, and Alice Cooper appearing in a supporting role in the film. Now, in an interview with Guitar World from 2017, Queen guitarist Brian May, who, by the way, we talked about um, we talked about uh, Jeff Beck passing away. If Brian May is not on your list of guitarists either, you have an incorrect list. He's probably one of my he was on one of my favorite guitarist lists. Queen guitarist Brian May recalls learning about the scene in Wayne's World. Lead singer Freddie Mercury died a few months prior to the film when it was released, and he was very ill while they were shooting the film. May tells Guitar World that Michael Myers, whom he didn't know, called him out of the blue and asked if they could have his approval to use the scene they shot to accompany the song. Brian May says he showed Freddie Mercury uh, the segment. Quote, he was confined to his bed, but I took it around to play to him, and he loved it, unquote. It's beautiful to know that Freddie Mercury got to see one of the best tributes to Queen oh, wow. and that song while he was still alive. But it could be said, however, that in 2022, video with Screen Rant, director Penelope Spheris 
said that she can't really believe it happened because the timeline doesn't seem to match someone's ability to get Mercury a VHS copy before he died. Well, who knows what happened? Either way, uh, we'll all bow our heads over and over again and to the beat and thank the rock gods that we have that scene forever to watch. It is. It is. I mean, even even if you've not seen Wayne's World, you've seen that scene or heard it or people are familiar with that little that little snippet it's from amazing. the film where they're hell headbanging. It's when so you mentioned funny. Beethoven earlier, you're right. If people have never heard classical music and they hear... They've heard that before. They know what that is. So mm-hmm. there you go. I love the scene when Garth takes the little Dixie cup out of his pocket. <laughs> yeah, and he has to, like, <laughs> right. r- unwrinkle it. If you're going to spew, spew in here. It's like a Dixie there's cup. Aren't they in his car? <laughs> He doesn't want him to do that. It's like so visually <laughs> ridiculous, and he delivers it like he really means it. He said, uh, "What was it?" Awesome. Dana Carvey did an interview where you know, because he has to, he has to hold his mouth in that position to do to do uh, Garth. Garth. He goes, "After so long doing that, it starts to hurt his jaw and stuff when you hold it in that permanent position." And I think Billy Bob Thornton said that as well of uh, Carl from Sling Blade because he has to put it, he has to contort his face into Carl's face mm. and then talk in that that voice, you know. But when you look at him, when you look at Billy Bob Thornton. And I've seen him in an interview go right from Billy Bob into Carl from mm-hmm. Sling Blade. He he changes his face to where he's almost unrecognizable as Billy Bob Thornton. It's amazing how he's able to do that. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Whooped him upside the head real good. You know who else was able to do it? The first guy to ever play Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in a silent film was Barrymore Sr. It's John Barrymore's dad and Drew Barrymore's great, great, great grandfather, I guess. But when he became, they, they didn't use a lot of a lot of makeup on him in the first version, the silent version of Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. He just contorted his face in a way and messed his hair up and stuff because, you know, they didn't have, didn't have a lot of effect no. back then. A, he changed his face. I want to show it to you on the break uh, on a YouTube video. He changed his face in a way where I'm like, that's almost impossible. How can you make yourself not look like yourself at all by just changing your face and holding that mm-hmm. and holding it? That's That's talented. You and I were talking earlier today about acting styles, actors, since Mercado Montalban, it's the date of his death, and it's the date of Alan Rickman. We talked earlier this morning on your show and off the air about actors who have their own style. We can talk about it again because we didn't do it on this show. People didn't hear us. Some of the some of the actors that act, but they ha- they actually created their own way of acting because they're so easy to imitate. We talked about Al Pacino's that way. <laughs> He's just, you know Al Pacino, that's him. Mm-hmm. You know uh, Alan Rickman was that way. Uh, Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken is that way. How many people do Christopher Walken? There's so many Walken impressions out there. It's great. Um, and I, I played. Uh, and you know exactly who's being yes. imitated when you see it. I played a oh, snippet. W- William Shatner. Yeah, I played a snippet from Shatner doing Bohemian Rhapsody. He's he say what you want about him, but he created. He's in that group of his own style of acting, and and it's and he's been successful at it. People can make fun of people like, oh, William Shatner's not a good actor. William Shatner's a good actor because you wouldn't have accepted him as Captain Kirk all those years and convinced that he was Captain Kirk or whatever he was playing. He may be, he may have that stage way of overacting or whatnot, but that's his that's his style. Funny, you, didn't he win all, a couple of awards he, for Boston Legal? He won an Emmy, I think, for Boston Legal. So you just don't they don't think they just give out Emmys or whatever. But uh, say what you want, he's more popular. When people were complaining about him, I'm like, hey, he's more popular than you are. <laughs> he made it as an actor, so yeah. people must like him. And what was what was the other thing? People people said in the old days or in acting there uh, in Hollywood, there's two different types. There's an there's an actor and there's a movie star. They're different. They're different. All all actors usually are movie stars, but not all movie stars are actors. They're more personalities than anything else. I'm like, okay. I'll I'll go along with that. That's that's pretty good. Did you ever see a movie with Peter O'Toole called My Favorite Year? No. Where he plays an actor that a guy has to wrangle and get a make him do a TV appearance to kind of I don't know I guess it save his career or help his career. But the the actor Peter O'Toole is playing is a he's a drunk, but he's a great actor from way back and he mm. still he overacts everything. I think he's kind of playing John Barrymore like character in it. And they're wheeling him in, and someone is getting mad at him for doing something because he's going to appear live on this guy's hot new TV show. And it's set, I think it's set like in the 40s or the 50s or something. And he goes, hurry up, get in here. He's about to go on. He's like, and he's, he's kind of lumping around because he's been drinking. He's like, come on, man, straighten up. You're an actor. He's like, I am not an actor. I'm a movie star. <laughs> it's just delivered with, okay, I get it. I know what you are. Now, I may have butchered that quote, but that's basically was the end result of him saying that. Which reminds you know, me, have actor? you not seen 
the Burt Reynolds, one of his last movies, the last movie star. I did. I, I told you about that. Yeah, back in back when oh. it came out, I saw it when it first came out. That's a great. That movie. is a great movie and a fantastic movie for his last film. I mean, it really was. You got to admit. And it, I got kind of, I kind of, kind of melancholy. I thought it was great, but it was very melancholy the, watching it. The idea that the writer had of being able to put him with some of his iconic roles, right? But not call him what those roles not were. Not playing for, Burt Reynolds in it either. He's but, playing somebody else, but, but he's playing but himself. You know, oh my gosh, so good. It was. It was great seeing him talk to himself in those films. Right. You're like, is this? Is this a biopic? Is he? Is this how he felt? I think it may have been partly true, probably. It's about he's a, an aging actor, and, and the group that idolized him, mm-hmm. and he's getting mad at him, making them mad. And it, it analyzes the same thing you're talking about. Am I a star or was I an actor? And and who am I anymore? And he was older, and it was oh. la- his last role, and he was great in it. It was so. Good. It was really great. I would. I w- Watch it, folks. It's on streaming. Watch right it. Now. It's called the last movie. Last movie star. The last movie with Burt Reynolds. It's great. Be on there. Happy New Year, everybody. We're in 2023. We'll be back next week. Yeah, and monkeys might fly out of my butt. So long, farewell, I'll be just saying goodnight. I hate to go and leave this pretty sight. So long, farewell, I'll be just saying adieu. Adieu, adieu, to you and you and you. Goodbye. Goodbye.